Carnegie Mellon Vaccination Database Talks are made possible by Ottertune. Learn how to automatically optimize your MySQL and Postgres configurations at ottertune.com. And by the Stephen Moy Foundation for keeping it real. Find out how best to keep it real at stephenmoyfoundation.org. So uh, we're happy today to have Adam Kokolowski. Uh, he is an IBM fellow uh, working on uh, the cloud, cloud systems. Uh, he was also a, a co-founder of, of Cloudint, which IBM bought, and that's why he's there. Um, my favorite thing about Adam, I've known him, I've known about him, I've never actually got to meet him. And the only reason I know about him is because he worked on databases and he has a PhD in physics from MIT, which is a uh, not something we come across of come across very often uh, in our line of work. So Adam, I'm super happy for, uh, super grateful for you being here. And as always, if you have questions for Adam as he gives this talk, please interrupt him. Say who you are, where you're coming from, and ask his questions. Ask your question, and you know, feel free to do this anytime. We want this to be a conversation, and not just him talking, you know, to the void and Zoom. Okay, <laughs> Adam, go for it. Thank you so much for being here. All right, Andy, thank you for the opportunity and for pulling this series together. I personally have found it a, a great resource to you know keep abreast of all of the things that are happening in our field across you know this broad spectrum of different projects and products. Um, so I'm here to talk to you today about Apache CouchDB. Uh, an oldie but a goodie in, in my point of view. Um, so Couch has been through the sort of requisite decade of, you know, poking and prodding and so on, running production applications. And I think we kind of uh, know a lot about what it's able to do and, and know a lot about what it, you know, maybe doesn't do such a great job at and where we want to take it going forward. So what is it? Uh, it's a DBMS as a web service. So the HTTP API, the, so the JSON, you know, protocol for exchanging the data is the way that you interact with this database. There is no sort of, you know, around the side uh, interface there. Uh, it's a document store, you know, it just sort of embraces that model of uh, variant data types and so on of, you know, that being the way that you you organize your data. So it was all, it's always been positioned as something that sort of is intended to be easy to get started for an application developer who is iterating fairly quickly on the functionality that they're introducing and doesn't maybe stop to think too hard about, you know, normalizing all of their data right from the ground up. It's also got a big focus on event-driven systems uh, and reacting to events and reacting to updates that are happening in the database. And we'll go through sort of, you know, the, the investments that we make under the hood to support that. Um, there's a whole system for view, materialized view maintenance, which is entirely asynchronous and typically is done by users defining uh, those views in uh, JavaScript functions that they upload into the server and get executed in the sandboxed environment. And the big one that I think probably a lot of people continue to adopt CouchDB for is the flexibility of its support for data replication, not just you know active active replication between a couple of cloud regions, but also systems that might be disconnected for extended periods of time, systems running in constrained environments. Um, there's a whole set of workloads that I think uh, take advantage of CouchDB in, in those kinds of scenarios. Um, we've been a member of the Apache Software Foundation for the past 12, 13 years. Uh, it's a database that is largely written in Erlang, um, which has certainly pros and cons. If you try to do heavy duty numeric processing in Erlang, it's, you know, typically you drop into C pretty quickly. On the other hand, the um, crash isolation is really nice. It's rather difficult for one misbehaving connection to do much more than crash their own connection. Uh, and that gives us you know, a, a nice model for sort of isolating different users, isolating different workloads. Um, so for today, what I'd like to talk to you about sort of threefold. One, I wanna go through some of the, the fundamentals, like how does this system actually durably store data on disk and why does that matter for us you know, as, as administrators and, and developers using it? I want to go through that adventure in architecture, the view engine and the replication capabilities, because I think these are the things that kind of make CouchDB what it is in the broader DBMS ecosystem. Then I want to jump into the world that we introduced with 2.0, the world that my team at IBM spent a lot of time on when we were at Cloudin. That's the, the clustering system. Um, talk to you about how we built it what it's done well for us and also what it hasn't done so well for us, which motivates you know, where we're taking the project going forward, which I'm super excited about. All right, so the most basic job, right? How do we actually store the data that comes in? We do use bee trees under the hood or some approximation of a bee tree. It's not a purist bee tree by any stretch of the imagination where we 
write JSON documents and we don't spend a ton of time shredding them or anything like that. We, we really you know, don't, don't optimize much of the actual field storage at all. Um, but once those JSON documents are on disk, we create a tree structure that allows efficient retrieval of them by the ID of the document. Yeah. All of that goes into a single file in the original editions of CouchDB. And it goes into that file in an entirely copy and write append only fashion. I write the document down and then I write the, you know, updated leaf node of the vtree and then the path up to the root, uh, all, you know, sort of appending to that same file. Then I sit down and I have to write a header. So we, we you know, do a durable sort of write barrier with an f-sync, write the header, write another f-sync and boom, you've got your document durably stored. Okay. So that's my copy on write update path. Uh, this does a few nice things for us. One of the things that it does is snapshot isolation falls out of that in a rather straightforward fashion. A reader who starts you know, their connection grabs the last header that they can observe in that file, and then they use everything that that header points to for all subsequent reads associated with that you know, operation. And any concurrent writes that are uh, occurring naturally happen after that point in the file, and they'll never be observed by the reader who grabs that particular header. So that's nice. The other thing it does for us is if we do end up in a situation where a write fails halfway through, the crash recovery gets way simpler. You know, I still see folks in IBM who, you know, were authors on the original Aries paper, right? I still run into these folks. And, and, and that's a great robust design. Um, but like when I think about the steps that DB2 has to go through for the undo redo and all of the sort of replay of everything to get it back up to health, and I contrast that with this like, sort of brutally simple approach, all these folks have to do is open the file, go to the end, and seek backwards until they can pattern match on a 4K boundary and find a header file. Say, great, that's the header that, you know, the, that I'm going to use for the rest of my operations. The rest of the stuff afterwards gets truncated, and I've got a healthy database. Essentially, every prefix of our database file is itself a valid point in time, you know, do you have a separate yeah. plus tree per table or is it for the entire database? Like everything uh, database? Yeah, that's the other no semantic nomenclature thing. For us, there isn't a notion of a database that contains multiple tables. A database is a lightweight construct in Apache CouchDB. Maybe you could treat it as more analogous to a table, except for the fact that there's no cross database querying. So what we oftentimes do is users create a database and they'll duct type things. Documents will have different types. You can create views that correspond to different you know, uh, tables of your data. But um, it's we, we have systems where you could have 100,000 databases in a single instance of the server. Okay. I mean, in defense of the Aries guys, like, you know, that Mohan and so forth. Yeah, yeah. They're doing, they're doing transactions across tables. This is one Absolutely. Two. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It's far simpler when you're, you know, your boundary of isolation, your atomicity is a single record. Absolutely. Yes. I think, you yeah. know, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about, you know, some of the work on, on that side of things and down the line. But yes, I think yeah, the Aries stuff is great work. Um, our constraints in this original world of NoSQL were, you know, Quite simpler. You're throwing out a lot of features, and as a result, you end up with a system here that, that uh, allows for some fairly quick recovery. Um, the downside of this approach, of course, is you know as you can imagine, seeing all of the I/O that we're doing to update one single document, uh, these files can become quite bloated over time. You know, uh, if I have a random pattern, I'm updating documents across you know the space. I got random primary keys. Um, I'm rewriting these B tree nodes very, very frequently. And the you know, pure append only nature of this means that the old nodes that are referred to by an earlier database header, you know, they continue to exist in that file in perpetuity. So we have to have a vacuuming process you know, that, that goes through and takes all of the, the, the entries that are accessible from the latest database header and writes them to a new file and drops the old one. And we have to do that on a fairly regular basis. So it's a good trade-off for us, but it did mean that we ended up spending an awful lot of time over the years sort of optimizing the throughput of that process to ensure that it could stay ahead of any actual right workload that was coming in for clients. Right. And you're, I mean, maybe it was talking about the like your secondary indexes are just more B plus trees. Yeah. You're asynchronously updating. That's right. There's two indexes that we're atomically maintaining, you know, on write. Everything else is asynchronous update. All right. Okay. Uh, yeah, go, go ahead. Yeah, so that's actually a good segue because um, the other index 
is this one. So we, as I said, we do uh, maintain these two indexes atomically. Every time you write a document, we're maintaining the primary key index, you know, finding documents by their document ID. But the other thing that we're doing is maintaining this changes feed. And so this is an index of all the documents that have ever existed in that database in order of their most recent update. Um, so if you're inserting a new document, then that shows up at the end of the changes feed. Uh, if, on the other hand, you're updating, you know, document Baz here referred to in sequence number three, we'll remove it from sequence three and insert it again at sequence five. Okay. Um, because we're paying this overhead of having a second atomic index, an atomically updated index, we try to drive a whole bunch of different bits of functionality off of it. The database compaction processes, they walk this sequence index and, you know, write things to a new file. The materialized view engine powered off this sequence index. And the replication capabilities are powered off the sequence index. The other thing that we chose to do, you know, one of the sort of last API changes we made before releasing 1.0 of the project was to externalize this index as, you know, a JSON endpoint, the, the changes endpoint in the database. Uh, so any client could come in and get, you know, sort of line delimited list of JSON records that, uh, you know, have been updated since the last time they checked in. All they have to do is remember the last sequence position in that feed, and they can incrementally ask the database at any point in time for the future, tell me all the records that changed in the database since the last time I checked in. Oh, well, the nice thing about this is there's no situation where if you don't check in frequently enough, you have to do some sort of full resync of everything, right? The database isn't going to end up in a situation where you've you know, the, the bin logs have fallen off and you're no longer able to actually replicate. You can just, you know, continue to ask uh, what's changed since the last time I checked in. We find that people use this directly. You know, they'll set up an AWS Lambda function or something like that to just listen to that change capture feed and, you know, drive their own business logic off of it. It's also something that powers ex in integration with external indexing systems. You know, there's a what used to be called a river in Elasticsearch. If you wanted to create a full text search index off the side of your database, you could just have it listen to this change capture feed and you know, off you go. Um, so you know, it's, it's nice that you don't have to have another piece of functionality, another piece of code sitting somewhere that translates an on, you know, a commit log sitting on the, on the node into an API accessible list of, of change capture events that just falls right out of the API directly. Uh, deletions, importantly, that's the other point I was going to make here. It is every document that has ever existed in the database. We need that because you need to know if a document was deleted to remove it from your external index. Unfortunately, that means if you've got a workload that creates ephemeral records and removes them with reckless abandon, it can cause this index to become very, very large over time. So it's not the set of all documents that exist at the moment. It's a set of all that ever existed. Is this also compacted? Yes. It is, but those those little tombstone entries do not get removed. All of the extra metadata gets removed, but the individual tombstone entry that says this document once existed and is now deleted stays. Okay, so if I said, give me everything since one, I wouldn't get two, but I would get six. That's correct. You'd get one, four, five, six. Thank you. So topic three, the view engine. This in 1.0 was really the only way that you could do any efficient querying of CouchDB by something other than the ID of the documents. Uh, the way it works is you create a special class of document called a design document. Uh, that design document can have one or more JavaScript functions inside that create views. Those JavaScript functions get executed against all the documents in the database, and they can choose to emit zero or more key value pairs for each document that they process, right? Um, so that gives you the opportunity to, if you want, it can be as simple as just uh, creating an index on some property of the document. It can be a little bit more sophisticated. You can fake a certain basic type of join, for example. If you had a posts table and a comments table, you could create a view of a blog post and all the comments associated with that blog post in one order, presuming your comments have an attribute that says this is the ID of the parent with which they're associated. Um, as I mentioned earlier, 
the views are not the kind of thing that gets run in the commit path. Uh, they are all done asynchronously. You can, you know, when you go to query CouchDB, you say, all right, I'd like to query this view. It's going to refresh that view automatically for you and hand you something that is updated to the, you know, current sequence of the database by default. Um, but, you know, that's the, the, the basic gist of it. And as, you know, Andy, I think you asked earlier, under the hood, this uses the same basic B tree structure that we're using for the primary key index and the changes index. Um, speaking of that B tree structure, I mentioned that it's definitely not a sort of purist B tree. One of the more exotic things that we do with that B tree is we actually store aggregations in the inner nodes of the tree. Uh, so in the main indexes of the database, that's just some basic statistics. That's all sort of server controlled. There's no user controlled, you know, flexibility on that front. But in the view engine, we have more flexibility. You can choose to define on a view in addition to your JavaScript function that sort of sets up the index itself. You can choose to say, I would like to you know, maintain these statistics. And there's a bunch of built-ins on that front. You can have it do sums and counts of various things that you emit. Uh, you can have it do hyper log log sort of count distinct, you know, approximations, that kind of thing. You can also give us a JavaScript function that will get run over, you know, sort of everything underneath a particular node, all the direct descendants of a particular node in the B tree. So at the leaf layer, you'll be running your reduce function over all the key value pairs that were emitted from all the, you know, sort of that chunk of the B tree. But your reduce function also has to run at the parent, you know, nodes in the tree as well. And there it's reducing the previous output of the reduce function. So you incrementally build up all the way to the, to the root of the tree. Um, this can be nice because it gives you a really low latency incrementally maintained statistics. It's expensive to maintain these statistics, but it's cheap to query them. You know, at the, at the root node of the tree, for example, like getting the aggregation over the entire view is something that like will always be there and be up to date for you. You also though can use it to do reductions, you know, aggregations over every unique key in the tree, if you like. You know, so all the events, you know, that, that share a particular event ID or something of that nature. You can even do something a little in between, which is, you know, if your key happens to be a JSON array, you can get aggregations at multiple levels of granularity. You know, the whole unique key, the whole timestamp, you can do an aggregation of everything that shares that exact key. You can also do a prefix and say, well, I just want, you know, the sum of all the sales for a particular date where my key was year, month, date, hour. And this system will efficiently recompute that for you. I should probably have a little better of a picture on the side here, but what ends up happening is as it traverses the tree, we pick up the aggregations at the highest possible level that we can pick up. So in some cases it may be, you know, a fairly high parent node because you're interested in the, the aggregation of everything underneath that, that inner node. In other cases, we may have to drop down all the way to the leafs because you're asking for an aggregation over a boundary that doesn't cleanly map to some portion of the B tree. And that's okay. We'll rerun that, just that portion of the aggregation at runtime, merge the results and give you the final result. What does the query look like for something like this? Because you, you, you supposedly have to write, like, I want to do a lookup. Uh, like, so you have these underscore sum, underscores count. And I understand those are special cases that you guys handle this underneath the covers. But then when I write a query on it, I know that they explicitly say, I know you have this aggregation pre-computed. Like, yeah, like, it really is so explicit. Like, they, you know, this is not the talk to come think about cost-based optimizers or really even declarative sure. theory languages of any kind. It is, I know that I need this aggregation. This aggregation is going to have a unique endpoint, a unique URL, and I can be flexible in terms of the ranges that I want to query, the number of results I want to get. I can skip ranges and things of that nature, but like I'm explicitly going after this particular index that I have defined. Okay, that's right. Okay. Yep. Um, I noted that there be dragons in the do-it-yourself JavaScript function world in part because we oftentimes see people write aggregation functions that like they do more of a projection than an aggregation. They just they they don't reduce the data. You know, there's the best reduced functions they're going to produce a single scalar value. They're not going to produce some complicated JSON object that has all sorts of various, you know, things computed. Um, and, and oftentimes we find that that to be the case. So this is not the easiest bit of functionality to use in the world for sure. Uh, but it has proven to be, you know, kind of an important tool in people's toolbox when they're building applications against CouchDB. Yeah. 
Did your bee trees, are they variable node sizes or are they always like- Yeah, that's eight? the worst part of it. Yes, yes. The chunking function on the bee tree nodes will not necessarily have the same number of children each time. So if the aggregation yep. of the inner node gets too large, you end up with this like ridiculously tall bee tree as a result. That's right. Yeah, that's why it's not a bee tree. That's right. <laughs> So that brings me to replication. As I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, the replication capabilities are the thing that I think keep people coming back to CouchDB. So let's talk about what that looks like. Um, with all of the things I've spoken to you about so far, you know, the, just the change capture feed, essentially, you can set up an active passive replication, no problem. You can get this incremental list of all the documents that have changed on one server and replay those uh, updates over on the other server. But we also you know, have people that use it in different scenarios. We have uh, lots of situations where people want to take a replication of a database and then take that second instance into a disconnected environment. We have folks who are using CouchDB um, for like uh, airline infotainment systems. So the developers are continuing to update the catalog in some cloud database. When the plane starts up, it has you know an updated catalog and then it disconnects. You know it doesn't kind of keep going on that side and is able to serve things out you know to the individual um, you know headrest units you know, throughout the flight. Uh, we also have, um, furthermore, situations where we, you know, that disconnected system is not just a read-only cache of the data, but it's something that's accepting additional updates in its disconnected state. Uh, we've seen you know, retailers kind of do this more and more where um, the, the back of the store might contain a filtered subset of the product catalog for that store, but it's also allowing for transactions to be recorded in the event that you know, the connectivity uh, at the store location goes down. Okay? So they wanna be able to continue to record updates you know, in the store and when connectivity is restored, sync those things back. Uh, in particular, they wanna be able to do that without losing any edits. And I feel like it's one thing to say, Sure, you can run active active replication between your US East and US West and your application developers should just be really careful about kind of partitioning their rights so that they don't clobber each other. But it's a bit of another thing when you're trying to do that with instances that could become disconnected for arbitrarily long periods of time. We don't wanna give people the opportunity to just blow away their own rights with reckless abandon on that front. So for that, we need to introduce an additional piece of functionality. And that is the built-in edit tracking associated with every record, right? So now I'm talking about inside an individual document, that document maintains a history of its revisions. And a lot of people jump to that to say, oh, I can build you know, a, 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 a Wikipedia system, a history system inside the document. They're not intended for that. They're intended for concurrency control, essentially. Identifying when updates to this individual document identified by its ID have occurred in multiple servers concurrently. And being able to detect not only that those edits have occurred concurrently, but a provenance relationship between them. You know, did one edit, was one edit a descendant of another? Were they siblings, some other complicated history relationship? So what it is, is a basic hash history. You know, we, we generate a revision identifier from the contents of the JSON document itself, including the previous revision identifier. So the same sequence of edits applied in the same order to those two documents will result in the same revision identifier. In particular, there's no notion of an actor like you would get with a vector clock or a dotted version vector or things along those lines, right? Which can be a good thing, can be a bad thing. Uh, a lot of times you'll see people, um, you know, sort of expect that there's an actor and, you know, do an increment operation on two documents simultaneously and then replicate. Well, those increment operations were perceived to be the same edit from the point of view of the document itself. They don't conflict. You, if you want them to conflict, you have to actually explicitly introduce this notion of an actor you know, via some other attribute of the document or something like that. Um, the other thing, you know, because it is just a hash history, there isn't actually a git merge operation here. You can't find a, a hash history that has branched um, you know, like this and say, I want to resolve revision three on the one side and revision four on the other side, introduce a merge operation and make the history linear going forward. The convention is that you would submit an update to one of those branches and mark the other one as deleted so that there is only one you know, branch of the history that is still alive and still preferred and still served out to the indexers and, and things like that. 
A uh, couple other bookkeeping operations. We don't let these paths grow infinitely long. Uh, by default, we keep a thousand of them. Um, we, you know, which which can give you this kind of situation. I said servers could disconnect for very long periods of time, but if you have a server that disconnects from another one for so long that server A has, you know, a thousand plus updates to this one individual record, when you do the replication, there's no longer an ability to kind of link together these two edit histories and the document with a thousand and one edits will appear to be a new sibling of the original one, right? So we, it's a balance you know, between how much metadata do you want to keep and, you know, the, the potential for having these kind of spurious edit conflicts where we're no longer able to establish a provenance relationship between these histories of edits that are happening to this, you know, single document in two different locations. For the cleanup of the history, are you guys have like a dedicated background thread doing this or is it cooperative? Uh, the cleanup of the bodies of the documents is a background thread that's happening during compaction. The cleanup of the metadata itself, the sort of maintenance of the revision history information yeah. happens on commit. Oh, okay, okay. There was, I, I think I might've written a patch at one point to defer some of the cleanup of the metadata history for really expensive merging operations. And it, it was not a good idea. Like it just deferred the pain and it became more painful. Yeah. <clears throat> And you know the last piece of this, and, and an area where I think we've always sort of acknowledged there's plenty of room for improvement is that all we do is preserve the final, you know, part of each edit branch. Right. So so we'll never throw away the body of a leaf revision. When the background thread goes through and vacuums the database or compacts it, it will preserve every, the last entry in every one of the edit branches. And we'll never get rid of an edit branch entirely. So you know, there's a certain amount of metadata that always sticks around there. And we also don't do allow for you to say, hey, I, I get it. Thank you for being super, super careful with all my distributed edits, but can you please just resolve on this one field and throw away the others? You know, I, I really, I think it's okay. That would simplify a, a number of scenarios, um, giving people the opportunity, you know, to opt into that kind of server-side conflict resolution behavior, or heck to even, you know, pursue all of the stuff that's happening with uh, CRDTs and auto merge and all that sort of stuff. But that's another talk. I mean, do you find your users are, are can, I guess the history thing is kind of easy to read and it's not like vector clocks, so it's more, more complicated. Like, do people struggle with this like concept of like, I have these rich histories, I have to manually do it myself? Or do yes. people like, do people not know they need to do it? Uh, yes and yes. Um, okay. It's often the case that people don't know they need to do it. Although if, mm -hmm. There's a whole other discussion in the good and bad and the ugly of the clustering side of that thing. But okay. in, in the case where you're explicitly setting up active active replication between two different instances, yes, people say, okay, I, I think I know I've got a plan for conflict resolution if there's a chance my application's writing on both sides. They'll oftentimes build a view to help them power through conflict resolution in an asynchronous background task, you know, and, and apply all their logic there rather than like sprinkle it throughout all of their application. Um, but it's still not easy. Uh, you know, to do anything other than the most sort of rudimentary pieces of this. And I think like, I've always wanted to do a better job of introducing data structures that are, you know, that do the right commutative operations and merge themselves and all of that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, but it's just never, you know, risen to the top of, you know, being merged into the project itself. I think. So, you know, kind of circling back to the replication piece, just to summarize, right? Now we've got this ability to incrementally query the changes feed. We get this list of four, five, and six as the documents that have been updated. If I drill into you know, document four itself, I say, okay, you know, I'm replicating from DB1 to DB2. I recognize that this version 3825 is not present on DB2. So I create an edit branch in the history on DB2. And if I want to do this in an active active fashion, I just run the process in reverse. It is basically two separate replications happening, you know, at that point. And I move 312B and 489C back over to DD1. And now my revision trees are in sync for this particular document. And I just repeat that process for every document that shows up in either server's changes feed. And so that essentially was catch db1.0. All of the features that you know people use to build applications that I just showed you there, they've been present for quite a long time. That you know kind of mental model of what CouchDB is was pretty well baked. Any questions on that shape of things? If not, I'm good. Cool.
Yeah. I want to jump into the 2.0 world, which uh, the big, big thing there was uh, cluster systems, right? Um, so, you know, my company, we wanted to get to a place where we were able to manage these CouchDB-based cloud database instances in a highly available fashion. We wanted to support larger volumes of workloads, higher throughputs, and so on than what we were able to do just by optimizing a single server. And we had the flexibility with this NoSQL system to be able to do that in a somewhat simple fashion. So what we did is, you know, we took this one CouchDB database, split it into shards. We replicate those shards across nodes. Now it's still one single CouchDB endpoint, but there's multiple servers underneath. Each of those is responsible for, you know, some number of replicas of some number of shards of a given database. To route the databases, we just used a consistent hashing system on the document ID itself when we first launched 2.0. And so that would mean that some particular shard was, you know, the, the owner of an ID in the database. And the other thing we did, once we said, hey, we've got this whole changes feed and hash histories and so on, that can you we can use that to actually converge these multiple replicas of an individual shard if something should happen to one of them over time. So you submit an update and each of those replicas of the shard that hosts that document independently chooses whether or not it's going to accept the update. Um, this, of course, can be problematic because you know, in this situation, we'll we'll send back a you know a response that says, yeah, we've durably stored your document on multiple replicas of the shard, so you should go ahead and assume that it's been committed. Okay? But it wasn't committed on that one copy. That copy is going to have to wake up at some point in the future and replicate from its peers and and learn about all the updates that it missed in the interim. Right? Um, where that gets particularly challenging is in the secondary indexing system because now we've got multiple shards. The way the secondary indexes work is just a scatter gather thing. Each of those shards is going to independently build locally all of the secondary indexes that the users defined in view functions and so on. And if you hit the API and ask you know, for a view or use this new find endpoint that we introduced, um, it's going to ask you know, each of the shards, hey, what's your contribution to the secondary index? Because the secondary indexes aren't being reorganized anywhere, it's got to do a scatter gather every time, you know, even if you're asking for just you know a view that's going to return one record. It's got to ask every shard because it doesn't know a priori which secondary index is going to contribute to that result. And there's no quorum operations on the secondary indexes, so it's entirely possible that uh, you know the the update that I submitted there that was committed on two of the three replicas. When I go ask the secondary index, the third replica might be the one to respond. It hasn't yet replicated that change in, and so you get this kind of you know potentially wonky. Um, view of things. Can you publicly talk about like the worst case of like when things got really out of whack in the, in the, like with a setup? You know, we we the, <laughs> we basically had patch after patch after patch to minimize the chances of really wonky behavior. If a if a replica goes down for a period of time and wakes back up, it knows that it's not up to date with all of these other replicas, and so it will opt out of responding to most interactive requests. Right. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, it's it's like I said, it's it's one production motivated workaround and mitigation after another to give people a mostly consistent view of the world, right? As yeah. opposed to really solving the problem properly. Yep. Um, <clears throat> so that clustering design is essentially what we had from the 2.0 release up until the latest release of 3.1.1. And you know the pathologies that are kind of associated with that, and we started talking about some of them. Uh, scaling is an issue. You know, we've had systems where we had you know users who are powering through tens of thousands of view requests a second, and you know the bandwidth between the nodes is just going and going and going. And we're adding servers. You know, we're, we've run these clusters with hundreds of instances in them. In some cases, just because we were just trying to eke out just a little bit extra, you know, global query processing throughput here. Um, we already talked about the sort of lagging index reads because you don't do quorum reads on the individual secondary indexes. You run the potential of you know not seeing certain updates. Uh, the other one that comes in here are the change capture feeds. You know, if you think about this, the original 1.0 guarantee for the change capture feed was a pretty strong one. You know, you'd check in incrementally on the change capture feed and get the list of all the documents that had been updated since the last time you had checked in. We in the clustering scenario, 
the sequence index is not necessarily identical amongst all the replicas of an individual shard. You know, these updates can get applied out of order. You know, there's no leader, you know, there's nobody sort of ordering those updates. Uh, we do guarantee that you'll never miss one, but that means you may see, you know, an update that you'd seen more than once. And so we, we would, in the case of a healthy cluster, do a lot of bookkeeping to say, well, actually it was this particular replica of this particular shard that responded to this user the last time we didn't code all that into their sequence. And they would see a, you know, a view that didn't replay updates too often. But then if that replica goes down and we have to replace it with another one, now we've got to do some sort of mental gymnastics to figure out, all right, what's the least number of updates we have to replay? We have to guarantee them they won't miss anything. What can we do to try to pick the sequence that is you know, largest possible? on this other replica that we're replacing the failed one with. And so users that were building event-driven architectures didn't always plan for the idea that they might have to reprocess something they'd already seen. And to be fair, it's not a fun thing to have to do. And the last one that really gets you is back to your question, Andy. You know, It's one thing to design for the possibility of edit conflicts when you've got two individual distinct instances on two corners of the globe that are replicating with one another. It's an entirely another matter when this is you know, US East 1A and US East 1B, and you just happen to concurrently edit the same document and client one landed on replica one first and client two landed on replica two first. The system's not gonna throw either edit away. It'll converge them, it'll surface both. But this means that designing through conflicts becomes an essential element of building an application anytime that you have concurrent writers on the same piece of data. And that's no fun. So that led us to kind of think, all right, what can we do going forward as a project to really sort of solve this thing properly? And we talked about, well, could we introduce, you know, sort of raft style consensus mechanisms among the individual replicas of individual shards? And we worked through the effort to try to do that. But we also started looking at, you know, call it inorganic solutions to this problem. We wanted to preserve the existing API. We wanted something that was super reliable. We wanted something that could scale up to our needs as a cloud service provider, but didn't leave behind the community of people that are just running CouchDB on you know VPS instances to power their blog. And we wanted something that you know was sort of an impedance match. I mean, you could always like build this on Postgres if you wanted to, but somehow that didn't quite feel right, you know, to to do that. Um, so we ended up looking closer and closer at Foundation DB. And I know Marcus came in in the previous iteration of these talks and gave you guys the, the rigmarole around all of the deterministic testing and simulations that they do. And it's really, really cool. Um, I'm here to tell you that it also, you know, this combination of transactions and a key value interface is a pretty flexible solution for sort of retrofitting into an existing database. Um, it is, you know, a complicated project. You know, I feel like we're faced in the situation where we've got this kind of structure we're all proud of that's like slipping into the ocean. And so we got to pick it up and put it on more solid footing. Um, but the project I think is, is, is one that is turning out really well for us actually. In particular, you know, Foundation DB, I think if, if you're not familiar with it, it provides strict serializability in the underlying key value store, right? So that's a awesome building block, you know, with, uh, to be able to rely on and, and, and massively upgrades what we're able to do uh, in terms of the semantics we're able to offer compared to our current eventually consistent clustering architecture. It eliminates those edit conflicts when we're talking about a CouchDB cluster in a single cloud region, for example. It lets us kind of refocus the replication on the kinds of use cases that I described rather than having it be both the solution for availability within a region and for data distribution across regions and to edge locations. Um, it also lets us reorganize the way we do our secondary indexes. So that whole scatter gather mechanism can go away because now I can transactionally update my secondary index and keep it organized efficiently in another portion of the foundation DB key space. If the key space is ordered, I can build my views over there and I don't have to, you know, kind of have this parallelizable, but super tough to scale query side of things. And I get back to the face, the, the case where the changes feed gives me this kind of totally ordered thing. Foundation DB has a little baked in feature that allows you to inject the version of the database into your key at commit time. And by doing that, you can sort of have this ordered list of updates in the database just fall out the bottom. Um, you know, I guess that takes it a little bit beyond sort of basic key value store, but having that ability for the server to inject the version stamp of it. Uh, gives us, you know, a really nice little building block there. 
I jumped through that, you know, sort of really quickly in the interest of time there. But uh, yeah, like I said, I've, there, I've given a talk on this, you know, topic in its own right. Uh, but I think that, um, you know, the basics of it are that the combination of the transactions and the key value interface is both like flexible enough to satisfy this kind of brownfield scenario where you've got an existing API and existing semantics that you want to try to preserve and improve. Um, and also powerful enough to make that effort of slotting it in, you know, a project that's worth doing. But I mean, it, maybe the, again, I'm jumping kind of just different slides. But like, there's a bunch of applications that are running CouchDB now that have all this extra code to handle the version, you know, version divergence and complex emerging physics that. Like, yep. I guess I mean, all that goes, it, it, it's not that it goes away because the code exists. It just, there's nothing to merge anymore, right? So it doesn't never, never get some vote. Well, yes and no. I think that it allows us to refocus that on sort of, you know, the use cases where you want to keep a copy of the data in Europe and another copy in the US and you don't want to run a serializable transaction across those two environments. Sure. There are cases okay. where, you know, you, you actually want disconnected asynchronous updates, but I think you want to opt into that explicitly as an application developer and understand you know, your application is targeting an instance in this region and it might receive updates coming in from this other region and really scope in on the cases where you might have to handle an edit conflict as opposed to those just kind of falling out during the normal course of operations for one instance of your app deployed in one region. Okay, so, yeah, so, so it, I mean, foundation by default is everything serializable. You're basically saying like you still propose lower guarantees, lower consistency levels, and then all the CouchDB machinery that users have written from before, all that still applies in that world. That's right, that's right. And in fact, I think I, you know, this kind of illustrates it a little bit, right? So in this future world, where CouchDB embeds FoundationDB under the hood and delegates all of the persistent state management into FoundationDB and then is, you know, an API layer on top, you could have two separated CouchDB instances in two geographically distinct locations running CouchDB replication over the top, absolutely, right? Um, and the nice part about that is that thing scales to all these kinds of crazy topologies. We've got people that are running, you know, CouchDB instances in every one of the cloud regions and uh, replicating amongst all of them. So they've got this local cache of their data and local to every region, right? Um, but you can also have the situation where FoundationDB as a cluster scales itself out at its layer. Our view right now is that most of those use cases involve FoundationDB running sort of with relatively low latency links between the different members of the cluster. But FDB also has the ability, if you want, to stretch into multi-region use cases. Typically, those are designed more for reads are entirely local in one region, but you have serializable failover to another region in the event of a disaster, right? So that may be a reasonable trade-off, and we've designed the system to be able to choose to run in that model if you would so prefer, so that you know if you had to do a failover, you never had to deal with this eventual consistency, edit conflicts, and all of that sort of stuff. Um, but you're constrained, you know, in the terms of the flexibility, you're not going to get active, active behavior in both regions. In that case, it's really more of a failover system in, in exchange for getting those upgraded semantics. The last thing that's fun about that, though, is, you know, when you push all of the state management down into that transactional key value store, we're now application developers on top, right? We're building stateless, essentially, you know, systems uh, that, you know, we're, 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 we're concerned with the generation of indexes and query mechanisms and all of that sort of stuff, but we're, we're not dealing with the actual state, right? We can shoot any one of these in the head. We can use stateless load balancers on top. We can just start to participate in all the fun that the app developers are having, you know, in terms of managing stateless clusters of instances so long as we commit to doing everything that needs to be done to coordinate amongst these replicas through foundation db and so that was one of our design principles you know going forward on that front and you know i wanted to make sure we left a little bit of time for questions so like closing it out um coach db's done a lot of kind of novel things you know uh took a lot of interesting decisions in the early days of NoSQL that uh were just different from what the relational database management systems of the time, you know, were doing. I think some of that is motivated by, you know, the original founder of the projects working on the internal databases inside Lotus Notes and, you know, kind of taking some of the concepts from that world and looking to modernize them. I think the things that have stuck 
have been that that focus on event driven interfaces. I think we've seen that sort of API copied and exposed in a bunch of other DBMSs, you know, uh, after we introduced it. And the flexibility of the replication capabilities, I think, opens up um, a simpler way of deploying, you know, state management across these different environments than than what you know people would have to cobble together on their own if they were just picking up their own database. And so those continue to be the things that people pick up CouchDB for. On the other side, that combination that you get of strictly serializable key value transactions is uh, something that we've found to be um, a nice accelerant for us to, you know, really solve for once and for all the consistency issues that we have with our existing clustering system when running, you know, in, in what's logically a single CouchDB database. Um, and so with that, if you like working on CouchDB, if you like working with FoundationDB, if you just like developing systems that manage large fleets of vanilla database instances across cloud regions, my team at IBM Cloud is hiring. Love to be in touch. So thanks. Okay, awesome. And I will I will applaud on behalf of everyone else. Uh, so we have a few minutes for questions. I have a bunch of them. So, but I'll, I'll, I'll open to the floor. So again, unmute yourself and fire away. Oh yeah, you're, you're all suckers. I'll do it. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, so I have a couple of like, uh, I, 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 basically I have, I have high level questions about like sort of the NoSQL market. Um, yep. Like, you know, you guys and Mongo started roughly at the same time and, you know, they're wildly successful, right? Like, uh, you know, there's a bunch of other people that tried to replicate what you guys have done. Uh, I'm thinking Rethink, for example, and yep. we're not successful. Um, so in terms of like you and Mongo being the ones that succeeded, if there's anything you think that you guys did right that uh, you know, helped that happen. But then on the other hand, Mongo certainly has, for better or worse, the, the seems to have the mind share that like, if you want a document database, you go with Mongo. 100%. So I'm curious to see why, why is that the case that Mongo beat Couch? So I guess first question is why did you guys were successful in a SQL project when others failed? And then why does Mongo beat you? In terms, again, not in terms of performance or whatever, it's just yeah, a yeah, mind check. Yeah, absolutely. So I think I would say that our success was that we um, backed into the cloud database as a service business model because we didn't think of another way to make money. Um, sure. And, you know, at the time, a lot of people were thinking, you know, who's going to trust you with their data? And it turns out lots of people were actually really excited to offload the, you know, need to be a systems administrator and a database administrator. Uh, and so we just hit the right trend at the right time in terms of offering a database as a service before, you know, before RDS, before DynamoDB, before any of that, right? Yeah. And we found a way to kind of offer that value proposition and have that scale. Before Mongo even, right? Like Absolutely. Before, yeah. And now you see all of these other vendors that have the huge market caps and so on. You know they're they're shifting as into SaaS as fast as they can because the market really values that kind of revenue model for sure. Yeah. Um, so that was you know the, our success was being early in the database as a service market and proving that out as a business model. You know proving out the the low churn, the good recurring revenue, like that annuity business just worked for us. Yeah. Right. Uh, we didn't need to have tens of thousands of customers in order to to build a, a viable business out of it and something that became an attractive target for you know acquirer like IBM. Um, what Mongo did well, I think, honestly, when I saw the size of their client libraries and developer experience team, like it was much larger than the core database team for quite a period of time, right? They, yeah. Every new framework had a way to support MongoDB. And I, that was something that CouchDB neglected, you know, to our detriment. We said, we said well, it's a web service. It's, it's JSON and HTTP. I mean, you, you, you know how to make web service API calls. You just interact with the database that way. Pragmatically, we saved on staffing that way. You know, our development costs were lower as a result, but it meant we weren't able to create really idiomatic experiences for developers and really just improve their velocity. And at the end of the day, NoSQL, you, you, could, you could mimic the scalability of the system and all sorts of other things. You, know, you could reconstruct those properties in other systems, but the speed of development and the iterative nature of just sort of saying, yeah, the database isn't gonna put a ton of constraints on me as an app developer is something that I think is sort of particularly, you know, attractive and, and, a, and a sort of differentiating characteristic for these document databases. And I think it's something Mongo prioritized more. I think another, uh, I, I think Mongo promised a bit more than you guys as well. <laughs> yeah. like the the auto scaling stuff, right? Like is, um, which again, like, you know, it's, it, is that a good thing, a bad thing? 
I mean, I remember the days, right, when 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 sort of Mongo was promising much more than it could deliver. That's, yeah. that, that's not the case anyway. It's, it's a much more solid system. I, I agree there was a point that. in time where you sort of wondered if they were going to build fast enough to keep up with the claims that were being made before too many bad blog posts landed, right? Yes. Yep. 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 Okay. Cool. Um, so now, so, so how can you start a one? Two thousand eight, two thousand eleven. If you had to start doing it all over again, would you like? Would you still go with Erlang? And if mm. yes, why? If no, why? Because you guys are the, the most famous Erlang data that's out there, right? Like React is dead. Uh, I don't. There's, there's maybe like a few others that are like academic projects, but you guys are, are the you know the main ones. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Erlang did some really great things for us when we were the startup that was like releasing a new version of the database every week and not always entirely battle tested when we did like the, the runtime saved us several times. And, you know, the people talk about the sort of isolation model and stuff. The runtime debuggability of the system was also a thing. Like you could log in and sort of interrogate the individual processes and start changing them if you really wanted to. Like you could do some crazy stuff in that, you know, environment. Never would recommend it, you know, for a mature system. But in the early days, like you you could move pretty quickly. Hiring is an issue, you know, you could there's not a massive pool of developers who simultaneously are good at Erlang and good at databases, right? That you had to kind of train them on one or the other. Um, I think the community now is doing interesting things. You know, you've got like the Elixir project, which is a much more sort of expressive, easy to use language for building, you know, APIs on top, but runs on the same underlying runtime. Uh, and you've got, you know, the WhatsApps of the world and a few other major production users who are driving some pretty good, you know, enhancements and innovations in there. Um, would I do it all over again? Maybe, but I think I would probably have like, a more opinionated view about what types of functionality go where. You know, you adopt lower level system stuff in Rust or something like that and, and use Erlang for the things that have to do the concurrency and, and you know, connection management and all that sort of stuff, right? Exactly. Wouldn't try to do the whole thing in Erlang. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Um, what is the biggest engineering challenge you're facing now with porting CalcDB to Foundation DB? Like, ah, great question. Um, so a lot of it comes down to us really probably having been too lax in terms of introducing limits into the database, right? We, we weren't real prescriptive about like how long a transaction could run or how yeah. you know large an individual field could be. And so now we've got this deployed estate of all of this petabytes of data all over the place. And somewhere somebody has done something that runs afoul of the limits that we're trying to introduce. Like you, the, the horse is out of the barn and you know in another state. Like, yeah. so hardening that aspect of things is, is a challenge for us as we try to not only introduce a more powerful system, but, you know, something that FoundationDB is fairly restrictive about what it wants you to be able to do. And some of those are- Are you, go yeah. are you going about this in a, in a principled way or is it just whack-a-mole? It is currently principled, but as we get more urgent in desires to move the estate, I can imagine that it will be a little bit whack-a-mole. Like we're pretty oh, yeah. good now about sort of static analysis tools that'll look at your data model and say, yeah, this is compatible. Like we can, we can upgrade this. The runtime behaviors can be a little bit different. It's pretty hard to know when somebody might be, like somebody's request pattern might fit into a single short-lived foundation DB transaction or not, right? Got it, got it, okay. Um, all right, so before we go, I'll open the floor. Before I ask my last question, everybody else have a final question? Uh, super awesome, I appreciate you being very candid with us. Um, I guess my last question would be, you know, you're, you're you're high up at IBM, so you you have these discussions now, right? You're not you're not a foot soldier in the trenches, um, but are there any concerns that you can publicly talk about of like building a major product on Foundation DB, which is is open source but is controlled by another giant corporation? That, that to be honest, IBM is is known to be you know a, a bit you know loosey goosey with, with with their lawsuits, and not loosey goosey, but you know ride hard in the lawsuits, same with Apple, right? Like, so you guys are building a, a, just a major, you know, a major, major revenue source for you guys that are built in, on a core technology that you don't have full control over. Now you can always fork it, I suppose, but you know, that, that leads to other issues. That is a good question. Um, we're no strangers to the value of open governance. And I think you see in our open source efforts is oftentimes a concerted, you know, push on our part to make sure that strategic projects, you know, are, are maintained in an open governance fashion. 
Um, nothing committed on that front. It's a topic we've discussed at the moment. You know, we have a solid, positive working relationship across all the teams, but we also have to recognize, as you said, the strategic risk and be prepared to kind of carry it forward ourselves if we need to, you know? So I, that's really all I can say about it at this point is yes, it's, it's, you know, it's uh, something that comes up. I don't think Apple lets you, non-Apple people merge commits to them, right? Still, at least that was the last time I talked to, to, to Snowflake. It was that, that was the case. There, there, so there've, there's been steps on that direction in part because, you know, the for a commit to get into Foundation DB, you've got like just this massive set of simulation runs that have to be run and the framework for executing those wasn't actually open. It is open now. Okay. Um, right. So like, I think, you know, you're seeing the kind of practical steps that would need to happen in order for a more open, you know, mechanism to get to these things to the point where they get the green light. Got it. Okay. Awesome. All right. With that, uh, again, Adam, thank you so much for being here. This was an awesome talk. Thank uh, you. This is, this is a good deep dive into to CalCD, which actually is a system I've never actually looked at the source code in Erlang, so it's like, I'm not going to read that. <laughs> but actually, I, I didn't really actually know a lot of the internals, so I really appreciate it. Other, I knew about the copy I write B plus G, but that was tough. Uh, it was super helpful. Um, I also say, too, you have the classiest like, background of any of the speakers that we had, right? It doesn't look like you're in a bus terminal. Uh, it's, it, it looks, it looks it's good. So, okay. okay. All right, guys. So, again, thank you, Adam, for being here.